I have a strange scripture to read for a Mother's Day message. I've taken it from the Old Testament, and I'm going to read it from the Living Bible. If you want to simply listen, that would be fine. Isaiah chapter 6. In the year King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the temple was filled with his glory. Hovering about him were mighty six-winged seraphs. With two of their wings they covered their faces, with two others they covered their feet, and with two they flew. In a great antiphonal chorus they sang, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is filled with his glory. Such singing it was. It shook the temple to its foundations, and suddenly the entire sanctuary was filled with smoke. Then I said, My doom is sealed, for I am an unclean man, a member of a sinful, unholy of speech human race, and I have looked upon the King, the Lord of heaven's armies. Then one of the seraphs flew over to the altar and with a pair of tongs picked out a burning coal. He touched my lips with it and said, Now you are pronounced not guilty because this coal has touched your lips. Your sins are all forgiven. Then I heard the Lord asking, Whom shall I send as a messenger to my people? Who will go? And I said, Lord, I'll go. Send me. And he said, Yes, go, but tell my people this. Though you hear my words repeatedly, you won't understand them. Though you watch and watch as I perform my miracles, still you won't know what they mean. Dull their understanding, close their ears, and shut their eyes. I don't want them to see or to hear or to understand or to turn to me to heal them. Then I said, Lord, how long will it be before they are ready to listen? And he replied, Not until their cities are destroyed, without a person left, and the whole country is an utter wasteland, and they are all taken away as slaves to other countries far away, and all the land of Israel lies deserted. Yet a tenth, a remnant, will survive. And though Israel is invaded again and again and destroyed, yet Israel will be like a tree cut down whose stump still lives to grow again. Like I said, it was a strange text for a Mother's Day. But out of it comes four urgent, pressing questions. The first question is this. What's going on out there? I'm concerned about that as a parent who has brought children into the world. What's going on out there? Isaiah is at the beginning of his manhood, and what is going on out there for him is that King Uzziah died in the year King Uzziah died. Now that's a strange name to us, but for Isaiah that was a very important name. For it meant at the transition in the kingship that there was now the potential of a period of uncertainty and instability. King Uzziah as co-regent first and then later as sole monarch ruled longer as a king in Israel than any other king. A total of 52 years he had sat on the throne, longer than David, longer than Solomon, longer than Asa or Manasseh or Hezekiah, longer than them all. 52 years is longer than I am old. We change presidents every eight years or four years or sometimes less than that or in between. And it seems like when a president has served two full terms, which we haven't had since Eisenhower, that it's like a decade has gone by and we're looking at the next election at a time of uncertainty. Well, here for 52 years, there had been certainty. And now, with this king gone, the king of whom it is said, as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. That king is now gone, and Isaiah, as a young man, is facing stepping into a generation of political uncertainty, economic uncertainty, international danger, and internal peril. 52 years. I got to thinking about how long a time that is, although I haven't lived quite that long. It's been a lot of changes that have taken place in my lifetime. A lot of changes taken place in your lifetime. Isaiah knew the change of a king and the uncertainty that that brought, but probably there has never been in the whole history of humanity a generation of people who have known more change than the people that are in this present generation. I was thinking back to when I was a kid when black and white TV came in, and that was great to watch. And Captain Video took us on the fantasy of flight in space. And uh, Love of Life was a soap opera at noon which the whole family could watch. 
I am in the generation that lived before color television, before Vietnam, before computer, before rock music, before marijuana when grass was something you mowed rather than something you smoked, before cocaine when coke was something you drank, before video, before stereo, before space flight. We have seen tremendous technical and scientific changes and even greater we have seen changes in values and morals. The family has been impacted, high divorce rates, confused sexual values, abortion, child abuse, a lot is changing. Some people in the church were telling me yesterday they had some friends who has a three-year-old girl and the other day she plopped herself up on the bed and announced to her mom thus, Mom, I need a man in my life. I mean, you know, it used to be that college kids went through it and then high school kids, you know, started going through the same thing college kids used to go through. Then it was junior high and it was sixth grade. Now three-year-old, I need a man in my life. And her father said to her, Honey, I'm the man in your life. And she said to him, No, you're just my daddy. It's that kind of day, folks. There are two books that I looked at some excerpts at recently, one by Tom Parker, all these published in the last couple of years, called In One Day, and another by Mike Feinsilber and William Mean, called American Averages, Amazing Facts of Everyday Life. And they detail what's going on around us, what's going on out there every single 24 hours. Like, for example, police arrest the equivalent of 500 busloads of people in America every day. That's 28,000. And Americans drink 15.7 million gallons of beer and ale every 24 hours. That's 28 million six-packs. There's enough litter in bottles and cans from a day's drinking that would fill a baseball stadium 30 feet high. Americans drink 1.2 million gallons additionally of hard liquor, and that's enough booze every day to get 26 million people thoroughly stewed. 100 robbers, 100 robbers find it convenient to rob a convenience store every single day. 3,000 Americans today will be confronted by a robber. 60 Americans today will be murdered, over half of them by shots from a gun. And you may think that some things are safe, like riding the railroad, but today 20 people will throw stones at trains, and 20 more people in America will lay stuff on a track intentionally. Americans today will buy 38,000 Ken and Barbie dolls. Think about the role modeling that's going on. In fact, Mattel Corporation, Barbie's creator, is one of the world's leading manufacturers of clothing, selling 55,000 pieces of Barbie clothing a day. Americans smoke more than 86 million packs of cigarettes. If, as one source estimates, smokers shorten their lives by 5.5 minutes, or 5.5 seconds, I think it is, per cigarettes, Americans will collectively, today, give up 18,000 years of living. Animal shelters today will destroy 30,000 unwanted cats and dogs. And today Americans will snort a bathtub full of cocaine, 325 pounds in all. And today 5,000 people will try cocaine for the first time. During the school day, students will physically assault 200 teachers. And there are many more teachers than that that students will think of assaulting. Today, Americans will hand over $40 million to prostitutes. Americans will smoke 85,000 pounds of marijuana. That's a bale of pot the size of a small house. 600 Americans try to kill themselves, and more than 70 will succeed. And the U.S. Border Patrol today will catch 2,250 people who are sneaking in the country, out of the country, or trying to smuggle something across. Today, we will build five nuclear weapons in America. And today, Americans all together will watch 1.5 billion hours of television. That's equal to 2,300 human lifetimes. 2,740 kids will run away from home. 5,962 couples will wed, but almost 2,000 will divorce. 2,740 teenagers will become pregnant today. 3,230 women will have abortions today in America. 9,077 babies will be born, 1,282 of them to unmarried mothers. And today, 5,500 Americans will die for one reason or another. If they were laid side by side in a field of daisies, they would take up an acre of space. Standing in line at the pearly gates, the line would stretch for a mile and a half. All that happening in America. In the year King Isaiah died, what's going on out there? 
I think that young parents and younger people are worried about, should I get married and have children in a culture such as the one we are living in today? It's a scary time to be raising kids because it is so uncertain. There is presently, by the way, just so you'll know, before Senator Kennedy's committee in the Senate, a Bill S-557, which would mandate that all colleges in America, in order to receive aid, of any kind and in order for students in that institution to qualify for federal assistance, whether it's a loan or a grant, that that college must abide by a set of guidelines issued by the Department of Health and Welfare, which would mandate that in the medical insurance coverage of that college, which it must give to students, that, uh, that abortion coverage also be given as part of the medical coverage, meaning a college like SCC, in order for any student to receive a dime of federal assistance, would have to agree to provide abortion funding medical insurance. The encroachment upon private and religious spiritual convictions in our society is truly frightening in terms of the inroads being made. It is, to use a Dickens phrase, the best of times and the worst of times. Yet probably if any of us had a chance, we wouldn't trade places with any other generation. What's going on out there? It's a time of unpredictability and uncertainty. So we got asked another question. What's going on up there? And that's so key in Isaiah because he gives only a short moment to what's going on out there. It's the crisis that's brought him to God in the year King Isaiah died. So often it is the case, it's crisis in our life that makes us open and vulnerable to God. So Isaiah, as he begins his manhood, as a young man, comes to the temple and he gets his eyes off the time and the culture and what is transpiring and picks himself up and gets a vision of God. And that's needed. If we're to interpret the data in the world around us, we need a fresh vision of God. For we're not going to survive this day if we simply look at what is going on in the world. Neither are we going to survive this day if we simply look at what is going on in the church. It's a disaster in certain respects to what is happening in some sectors of the body of Christ today. And someone has well said that at times the church reminds them of Noah's ark. If it weren't for the storm outside, you couldn't stand the smell inside. So it isn't looking out to the world or to the church, but it's looking up. We, like Isaiah, always need that fresh vision of God. I saw the Lord, Isaiah said. Where did he see the Lord? Seated on a throne. The throne, the human throne, the throne of Isaiah was vacant. But that didn't mean that the real throne was vacant. God, seated on his throne, the Lord reigneth and is clothed with majesty and power. What Isaiah is saying is that very needed element of life. God, I know who you are. And in spite of the circumstances around us, I know that you are in control. God, you are in control of this age and of the family and of my life. And I confess to you that it is easier to say that at times than it is to actualize it. There are moments I realize that when that preachers say things that sound like sweet syrup, that sounds so good, but you wonder if they're true. I know I've had thoughts myself this last week when I was in Hong Kong, when I considered this message and knew that in it there is this phrase, God, you're in control. Just a few days ago, in fact, it was Monday of this last week, I was, uh, Jewel and I went out to a refugee replay, uh, encampment center in the middle of Hong Kong where Vietnam boat people were on their last stop. They had gone through a number of refugee camps and now had finally come to this last one before resettlement in another country. Fifty families packed in a single small Quonset hut about the size of this platform, each to a bed, that's their living quarters. And they're waiting for freedom in a new country. Some of them will be in that single camp over a year. And Jenny has gone in with her companion Marilyn and begun a school system for these kids. We went through that refugee center and then when we were just about done with the tour, Jenny said to me, now I'm going to take you to a part of this that is going to depress you. And she was right. We went into an area and as we entered behind the barbed wire and the gate, she said, you are now in the area of the refugees that are waiting resettlement in red China. I thought to myself, how can that be? But it turns out that China made itself available to the United Nations as a resettlement country for Vietnam refugees looking for freedom. 
and because of the UN Charter and its inability to discriminate against nations, it qualified as a refugee resettlement country. So here were people waiting for the glorious freedom waiting them in communist China. There were two little boys that especially grabbed my attention. One a little guy of about nine months or 12 months and another about two years of age. Jenny said, I want to tell you about these kids as she hugged them and kissed them. She said, this little boy, the youngest, was brought to this camp when he was just a baby, just been born a few weeks. His mother was swept overboard and her husband dived into the sea to try to save her and they both drowned, leaving these two little boys orphaned. She said, you see that woman there? She can't understand what I'm saying, but she volunteered to take the kids. Do you see these blue, black and blue bruises on this little boy's face, referring to the two-year-old? That's where she has hit him. It gets a lot worse than that. We have no power to stop it. You see that man sitting next to her? Well, she lost her husband also in the boat ride and he was a single man and rather than go live at Victoria, a prison where the single refugees have to go, he volunteered to live with her in her bed and be the custodian of these boys. These boys are abused all the time and they will go to China with them and God knows, she said, what will happen to these boys when they get into China. And she said, I've done everything we know how to do to try to somehow get them out and get them in somebody else's hands, but they're the property of China. And I said, God, it's not fair that these precious little boys so filled with love should be so violently abused and should suffer the fate of living a life where they will never know the joy of human freedom. And I struggled and the words choked in my mouth, God is in control. Maybe you've had situations in life where you've had the same words choke you. Can it be God is in control? And when I walked away from that camp and Later in the day was out with my cousin David Plymire in Sha Tin, which is in the New Territories, a few miles outside Hong Kong, and went through and reviewed with him what he was doing. My cousin David, who was raised in China, speaks Chinese so well that he is able to go on the radio with a Chinese name, which he has, and nobody would ever guess he was a Westerner. What is he doing now? He is every day on the air for 15 minutes teaching through a 250,000 watt radio station transmitter located in South Korea. Reaching into China, he is teaching the pastors of house churches in China, most of whom have never had the opportunity to get any theological education, including reading a simple book on theology or Bible. Do you know how many house churches there are in China today? Remember, my parents were missionaries, and we left in 1949, and the church was small and pitifully small, less than a million people. Do you realize that now, today, in China, since 1949 to 1987, almost 40 years have passed, there are today in China 200,000 house churches. 200,000. And my cousin's voice is penetrating into many areas of China as other missionary programs are to give the church some outside help. And over 50 million Christians, if we had looked at that situation in 1949 and seen the missionaries all leave and the pastors arrested and many executed and the Bibles all confiscated and the hymnals all confiscated and the church doors all locked, we would have said, where is God? Are you in control, God? But we get a space of four decades and look and we say, oh God, look at what you've done in the meantime. And I said, as I thought about that and thought about those two little kids, well, God, right now in 1987, I don't understand what you're up to with those two little boys. But I can't throw away the resurrection of Jesus Christ or the truth that he has established himself forever as Lord by his resurrection from the dead. And this word is true regardless at this moment of what I'm feeling subjectively or experiencing. It's so often that life is like looking at the back side of a watch. You take the back part off and you look at what's inside and there's a wheel going this way and a wheel going that way and it looks like no sense is being made at all until you turn it over and see that there's rhyme and symmetry and reason that the back part is moving the front part that makes sense. So much of our life is spent looking at the back side of things and it is not until that day when we see him face to face that we will understand and in the meantime, while waiting for that day, it is important that we have a faith in a God who is in control. Sometimes the things that seem to hurt us the most, one author has said, are the very things that bring out the best in us. They are the struggles that help us discover the faith we thought we'd lost, the strength we didn't know we had, the courage to let go of the past and begin again, 
Some of you need to begin again, need to make the break and to begin again because challenges help us to see who we really are, where we want to go and what our lives can be if only we have faith and keep on trying. When I got home, I was going through my mail and there before me in the stack was a publication from Wycliffe Bible Translators, which I read every month in other words, which is published and done by some members of our congregation. It goes out worldwide to Wycliffe supporters. In it, there was a poem written by Jean Marie Crabtree, who is ministering for Wycliffe in Papua New Guinea. She recently went through a four minute earthquake in New Guinea. It's a very earthquake prone country. And by the way, one night while we were in Manila in our hotel room, up on the second floor, an earthquake came rolling along, woke us up out of a sound sleep. It lasted for two, uh, two minutes, 20 seconds. Now, when you have an earthquake at home, it's okay. You know, you know where everything is, but when you're in a hotel, it scares the living daylights out of you. So a four minute earthquake. And she sits down afterwards and writes this poem, which is based upon her knowledge, of course, of, of how earthquakes occur. And I thought it was so powerful because it describes this whole idea of going through struggle and, and worrying, you know, in a time of shaking. God, where are you? Are you really in control? She says, Dear Lord, it isn't always comfortable being on the edge of the shifting tectonic plates of character qualities, colliding with this virtue and that, always seeming to be the subducting plate, always being forced slowly but surely to bear the weight of the foreign mass. But Lord, that's how mountain peaks are formed, isn't it? And continuing subduction causes continual height increase. It's at the edges that we shape new character, isn't it? In the interior of the island of my life where all is stable and static, I'm not forming mountain peaks, but marshes, not grander, but gunk. Lord, keep me on the growing edge of life's adventure with you. And I get revitalized when I get in the presence of the Lord and find him saying to me in the midst of chaos and turmoil, I am making you. It's on those growing edges of life that the mountains are being formed. Isaiah saw God. Which brings us to the third question, what's happening in me? He looked at what was happening around him and what was happening up there. And now, Lord, what about what's happening in me? I make myself available to you. But before he made himself available, he saw the flaws in his life. It's when we see God clearly that we clearly begin to see ourselves. Isaiah, as a matter of fact, is one of the most righteous and pure persons in the Old Testament. And yet he has perhaps the most sharply define personal sense of sin. That's a paradox, isn't it? The guy who was the cleanest feels the worst. I went through the book of Genesis while I was gone and I was jotting down some things about the heroes of the faith and discovering that there were a lot of skeletons in their closets. But not with Isaiah. There are no skeletons in his closet that we know of. Pure and moral and filled with integrity. And yet when he comes in God's presence, he sees the tremendous flaws in his own life. And that's the case. When we really see God, then we have no ground for boasting. We see the things that are wrong in us, the little things. It may seem little to other people, but they become big to us when we see them. The little lust, the little greed, the little envy, the little anger, the little unforgiveness, the little bitterness, the little self-pity. When we see God, we focus away from the faults in others to the faults in ourselves. It's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's so great to know that we have a gracious Lord who takes something off of his altar to burn away our guilt. God cauterizes our guilt. And when he has dealt with our sin and cleansed it away, then he says to us, whom will I send and who will go for us? And to mothers today, as well as to fathers and to all of us, God is asking, will you let me use you? Will you, let me, will you let yourself become available to me? Will you say with Isaiah, whatever, Lord, you want of me, I will do it? And that brings us to the last question. What's going to happen in us and through us when we've become aware of what's happening around us and where, who God is and what the need is in our own life and volunteer to serve God? Then God has a mission and a task for us. He's going to work through us. Now, as a matter of fact, the Lord very rarely lets us know what the future will be when he calls us to follow him. One of my favorite songs from my teenage years, when I used to sneak a, uh, sneak a listen to the radio against my parents' wishes, 
was uh, when I was young, I asked my mother, what will I be? Will I be famous? Will I be rich? Here's what she said to me. Okay, Sarah, Sarah. You know, you know that song, some of you? Whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. Que sera, sera. Man, I'd sing that over and over. I want to know what the future held. And God never told me what the future held. And, he, and I still don't know what the future holds. But what a difference. Isaiah was one of those few people that God said, no, okay, you've made yourself available to me. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. And I want to tell you, based upon what I read from Isaiah 6, that Isaiah got one of the rottenest calls to the ministry a preacher could ever get. Do you know what God said to him? It's, put it in my language. It would be like God saying to me, George, I want you to be a pastor. Oh, great, Lord, I want to be a pastor. Lord, what's in store out there? And the Lord would say to me, George, when you preach, you'll preach with eloquence and with power, but people will go to sleep while you preach, and you'll feel and see heads thudding on the pulpits in, or in the pews in front of them. <laughs> and when they, through falling asleep, they're going to begin disappearing and going elsewhere. And you're not going to pastor a church that grows. In fact, it's not even going to just stay even. And by the way, we define success in American culture by quantity of numbers. The more people you have as a pastor, the more successful you are. But Isaiah is told, when it is all said and done, the congregation you start with, you're only going to have at the most 10% left. That's all, Isaiah. That's my call for your life. Go preach to those stubborn people and let your preaching confirm their hardness of heart toward me. That's your mission. No great revivals will happen in your lifetime. No worldwide waves of the Holy Spirit. Just go preach and be faithful anyway. Oh, I just said, Lord, not me. Find somebody else. Get Jonah back or somebody like that. <laughs> not me. Maybe you're finding that life is very hard. Only unlike Isaiah, God did not warn you specifically in advance that it was going to be this hard. I recall the plaque that was given to me by the church on our 15th anniversary as pastor last year, which calligraphied my favorite phrase, what happens in you is more important than what happens to you. And with that two phrases I had not heard before in smaller type, the same wind that uproots a tree lifts a bird, and the opposing force becomes a lifting force if faced at the right angle. I thought how true that is in life. The same wind that uproots a tree lifts a bird. This adverse wind can kill me or it can cause me to soar. This opposing force can become a lifting force if faced at the right angle. And most of us will not only not know what our calling in life is, but most of us, unlike Isaiah, will not be called to speak to a nation, nor will we, be, will we be called to be remembered centuries after we have gone. But all of us still have a call of some kind. This is what the reformers so adequately and tremendously rediscovered in the scripture, that there is no such thing as a called out small group called the clergy, but all of us are called and all of us have a vocational and a family call in life. To be a mother, for example, is to have a call from God to minister to a child. It may not at times seem glamorous, and it may not lead you to fame, and your kids may not be famous, but from God's point of view, there are no little calls because there are no little people and there are no little places. I recall in college talking with an older friend, and he was getting ready to graduate, and I was still an undergraduate. And I said to him, what are you going to do when you graduate? And he said, I'm going to go to Kansas City. I'm going to get married and I'm going to teach school and I'm going to live an ordinary life. And my spirit rebelled at that statement and I looked down upon him inwardly. I thought, how could he listen to all those same gospel messages I've listened to and justify his existence on the ground that he was going to live an ordinary life? God's calling us in this generation to go out and do something great. And nothing less than great will do. You've got to burn out for God. What's this business of living an ordinary life? Isn't it amazing what 30 years will do to your perspective? And I began to realize that probably there is no more wonderful thing than to live well an ordinary life, which all of us in this room are really doing. Not many of you are famous or wise or powerful according to this world's standards. 
But all of us have a call because there are no little people and no little places. Master, where shall I work today? And my love flowed warm and free. And he pointed out a tiny plot and said, tend that for me. But I answered quickly, oh, no, not there. Not anyone could see, no matter how well my task was done. Not that, that little place for me. But his voice when he spoke was not stern, but kind. And he answered me tenderly, friend, search that heart of thine. Are you working for you, for them, or for me? Nazareth was just a little place, and so was Calvary. Where you and I are is a little place. Nazareth was a little place, but there Mary did her task well. We see in our day what is going on in the world around us, but in the midst of seeing it, we must see God, and then we must see ourselves and ask, God, what will you have me to do? And then do it. Father, we thank you for all of the mothers that are present here today. And we take a moment to each of us thank you for the mothers you gave us. Some of us have mothers who are now in your presence. We thank you for them all. We're so glad to be alive that they gave us birth in your will. None of us, Lord, had a choice about being born, but all of us have a choice about being born into spiritual life and eternal life, of being your child. All of us had human parents that we did not select, but in order to be your child, we must select our Heavenly Father. So consciously from the heart on this Mother's Day, I pray for anyone here who does not know you personally, that this very day they would open their inner life to you and acknowledge you as the Lord. May this Mother's Day they have a vision of who you are and of your power and grace and love that is made available to them. And then, Lord, for all of us, we pray that this day will hold a day of special meaning as we especially look at the scripture which has been shared this morning as we face the fact that within this great group of people today, there are those who are going through difficult times, the earthquake times of life, when lots is being shaken. We ask that in these times, you would be Lord to us, that we would not just see what is going on around us, but that we would also see you and gain strength from you to live as you would have us live. May we say with Jesus, Lo, I have come to do your will. We ask these things, Lord, in your name. Amen.